Okay, welcome back to, to the second hour. And we've been looking at uh, grief counseling. So something that we've done in the initial hour was just to understand grief. Uh, we've understood what bereavement is. We looked at certain symptoms and signs of grief. We looked at how grief is a process. We looked at different stages uh, of, of grief. Now we'll move on to, uh, you know, one of the most important questions um, that we need to understand is <clears throat> what can we do? What do we do? Uh, how do we how do we help? How do we um, how can we be more present through uh, through the time when someone is going through loss? So as we spoke about one of the things we said is yes grief is a normal reaction to the loss of someone and uh, we have that example right there in scripture where we see jesus um, at the home of lazarus grieving you know even though um, god knew the purpose and god knew that it would be glorified he would be glorified that god would be glorified through the miracle that was taking going to take place you see that Jesus experienced that sadness, experienced the grief that he wept, you know, and uh, that's a beautiful one. And I mean, there's so much of um, depth in that uh, to to know that uh, it is okay to grieve alongside with those who may be going through this uh, the specific loss um, or specific uh, uh, issues with with that with that. Uh, uh, loss event. Okay, so let's just uh, quickly maybe look at some broad points and um, uh, to understand how, and then I'll just take on to practical uh, guidelines about how what we can do. Okay, um, so that I, I think in general there may be certain principles um, that uh, contribute very effectively to the way that we minister or the way that we uh, help with people, okay? Uh, so this, maybe in some part, you could look at it as grief counseling. Nevertheless, I think you can still take some key principles from it. And even as you're ministering, you know, you could you could do this. So the first and foremost thing that, you know, we, we need to do is to um, work through the pain of loss, help them work through the pain of loss. So something, that um, you know like for example let's say you're going to visit a family because um, you know there's there's been a loss there uh you know so it, it's good to um uh sometimes help the pe help the person help the people over there uh, to come to a place of awareness that the death has occurred so you're actually helping them to actualize the loss right so uh, you're you're hoping that they will accept the reality before that the, before they can actually deal with that emotional impact of of that pain or of that loss so the best way to actualize that or walk them through that is to talk about the loss okay so our role um, even as we're going to minister and help is to be a patient listener and encourage them to talk about the loss, including any memories of the past or present of the person they've lost. So bringing them to a greater sense of awareness that the death has occurred. Uh, uh, and, and these can be achieved through questions such as, you know, um, how did the funeral go? Or what happened when you when you heard about this. So you're reliving some of that those moments is a place where you're actually helping them to actualize or helping them to go through that pain, pain of loss. Okay. Because when, when a loved one dies, the, the the person or the family experience actually a relational separation from their loved one. So they experience that misery that impacts them extremely emotionally, physically, and spiritually. But um, what you're what you're hoping to do is to help them over time to show them that encouragement is found in that the pain will not last forever. Okay, but you are bringing them to a place of actually um, 
thinking about the loss, grieving about the loss, so that um, they're able to relive that. Okay. Uh, while we're doing that, we're also helping them identify and experience their feelings. So like, like we said, there are numerous feelings that may come up. Some may not be recognized. Some may even be intentionally avoided by the, by the bereaved because of that pain that's associated with the love of the lo loved one. So with the loss of the loved one. So such feelings as anger, guilt, anxiety, helplessness, loneliness, they're all, you know, like problematic for bereaved people because in times of significant loss, the level of intensity of these emotions become extremely strong. Right. So that's why uh, emotions such as anger may need to be properly and effectively targeted. Guilt needs to be evaluated and resolved. Anxiety needs to be identified. So our role is to assist them to explore these and other feelings in order to resolve, to manage and to over overcome them. So identifying and experiencing these feelings enables the bereaved person to feel a sense of relief and encourage them to start looking further. So one of the things that you would probably also do is to help them see that these many grief emotions are common. Right. And especially when they're experiencing experiencing these, um, you know, just just uh, maybe an explanation that grief is this tangled ball of emotions that can be very, very disorderly. And it is crucial for them to understand that what they're feeling is normal and that it can be an extremely uh, consuming experience that can affect them. But it is important that you know the people or the, or the bereaved go through that pain and not not more not avoid it. And so that's why uh, you communicate that it it is it is a response to the loss that they have they have en endured, and um, that the the or maybe also like you know that, that the only way one one does uh, avoids grief is if they have not loved. But the fact that we grieve is a celebration of that gift that God's given us on, on being able to love. So helping them to voice out their sorrow, you know, through lamentation, through complaints. Um, you know, you, you read in, uh, in the Psalms uh, so many times, as I cry out to you, I cry from the depths of my heart, I lament, I bring my complaint to you. Right? It's, it's like bringing, pouring out their heart before God and before probably um, you know, those who are helping them to express that deep pain and loss they're experiencing. And through that journey, to be able to find truth in God's word, to help them to come to a place of acceptance that their loved one was is exactly where God intended them to be. Now, but but that again, you know, that's that's a process that you are helping them. But nevertheless, to help them come to a place of um, uh, experiencing those emotions, uh, to assist them to explore those emotions, to identify it, and to be able to uh, encourage them to um, uh, to find ways to cope. Okay. Uh, one of the other things that you know you would want to do is to help them uh, uh, assist them in living without the uh, the disease. So this involves helping people accommodate the loss by sometimes facilitating their ability to live without the person and make the, their own independent decisions. So in order to do this, um, you know there may be need to to use something like a problem solving approach where you you help them identify the problems that has arisen as a result of what since the loss has occurred maybe like for example uh, uh, you know it is a breadwinner who passed away so what's the next step in in getting uh, um, you know, for, for, for the people who are there to start earning, or maybe someone has gone through certain debts, uh, the person who passed away had left behind a lot of debts, how, how would, would that uh, assistance take place? Or maybe there are care of 
multiple members of the family. So whatever. So decision making um, uh, needs to happen there. And that becomes very valuable for them, right? Because when, when someone may be a primary decision maker, even the person who passed away would have been a primary decision maker. And the survivor often experiences you know, the problems of making those decisions. So you sometimes help to develop those skills, those decision making skills, to enable them to take over the role of decision making and to be able to minimize. So just walking through that with them. And through, through all of this, you're also helping them to find the meaning of the loss. You know, for example, there may some people who who have experienced a loss, um, sometimes you know, it, it's it's common that they 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 set up maybe a memorial honor or or a charity or a, they begin a um, you know an NGO or lobby for some change uh, or something or, or they they advocate something in order to prevent those kind of deaths, right? So this helps to create a feeling that the that the death of the loved one was not in vain. So that's something also, you know, you facilitate and if, if that's something that they would like to do, because meaning also is found in reassessing the perceptions about the death and also the assessments of the loved one's impact on the life of, of them. Okay? Uh, so that, that's what you, you work with them also to do. Uh, in the meantime, you're also, as we're doing all of this, you're also helping them to adjust to a place where the disease is missing. Now, they, they, they need to experience the comfort that can only come from a relationship with God and maybe you know to, with, a, with a larger body of Christ. So some of the things is to urge them to, um, you know, urge them to allow other Christians into their world or other believers into their world to walk alongside them and to hear their story. So this kind of support enables them to emerge from that time of grief, not just as surviving the experience, but having, uh, you know, um, having had the change that comes from, from experiencing whatever they've gone through um, in the eyes of what God would like, right? So they, they must just come alive and live in that present and, and for the future and then not just surviving for it okay so um uh, so, some of the things that that you know can be sometimes helpful is to get the people um to, you know if they've not done so before to be able to go through personal belongings uh, and to be able to adjust to that environment without them you know in ways on on how they can move on in with life so part of, part of helping them to move forward is to encourage them to find appropriate ongoing emotional connection um uh, with 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 uh, other people you know to build relationships uh, outside so teaching them to walk in faith to walk in truth and not just by their feelings so each person you know what you're helping them do is to embrace that you know god's faithful and to help them to cling to him as they begin to accept that loss and begin to see that healing and hope they often will need to refuse to allow their feelings to direct their course of their lives instead be transformed you know by by the ways of renewing their mind so encouraging them to consider how also, they're thinking about their loss. What are they? What they? What? What are they actually processing about the loss? And sometimes it's uh, it can be done through a very simple exercise. You know, whenever they feel tempted to fall again to despair, to get them into the habit of asking themselves, you know, what are they thinking about? How they have responded because of that kind of thinking, and then help them to go back to God's word, learn what He says um, about thoughts and responses, and to help them to be honest, to to come. Uh, to a place of understanding about what they're feeling, but not to be driven by their feelings, to help them learn to cling to what God's word says is true, then help them to walk by faith. Okay. Uh, through time, you're also giving them a new perspective on their suffering and their loss. So giving them passages or uh, helping them to meditate on God's word will help them realize that they are presently, in whatever they're presently enduring or going through has a purpose. And God desires to use this time to benefit others who grieve. So you're helping them to see that when bad things happen, um, you know, the, these terrible circumstances is what uh, is what God can use 
to bring out the best uh, best use in them. So um, when you're facilitating this, you're also um, helping them to come to a place of healing. You're, when you're providing time for them to grieve, you're, you are allowing for, um, uh, for those individual differences on the way that they experience life, you're helping them to grieve. One focus that we need to be vigilant about is to examine what are coping styles. Now, what, what sometimes happens is, you know, especially when people are not able to go through grief well, they can be certain dysfunctions. When What do we mean by dysfunctions? They can get into um, difficult, co um, uh, unhealthy coping strategies. Like, uh, for example, one common in, in uh, way of is substance use, maybe t turning into alcohol, turning into drugs, or you know, getting lost, addicted into something else. So you look for these ineffective coping mechanisms, um, and you know, uh, uh, and help them understand that this can actually intensify the experience of grief and dep depression, and it can impair that process of bereavement. And often people don't understand that that anything that you get hooked to or get addicted to gives momentary fulfillment or momentary uh, feelings of, of peace or satisfaction, but then it just puts them back into, it intensifies that experience and impairs whatever process has been done. So, um, you know, you can highlight the various other coping strategies that are, that are good and encourage them to evaluate and use more effective ones and explore new coping mechanisms like probably finding um, something meaningful to do, maybe sharing their grief with, with one other person or to be able to express their grief through different creative means, maybe through a painting, through a poetry, through a song, through music, um, through a blog. Uh, um, helping them to cope through exercise, through keeping oneself uh, healthy and fit, um, or, or you know, even even being able to do something that's creative. So being able to uh, understand this. Now, um, it's also important. Even as I, and this is what I said that I will I will discuss here uh, to be able to identify when it can become pathological. Pathological means more. Uh, more more like a disease or a disorder so we call grief said normal but if it goes beyond and if it is uh, if it is not something that is healthy uh, and and it's affecting the individual we call it a pathology right so it is to to know when it is becoming pathological and when you need to refer so if you identify the existence of pathology that has been triggered by the loss it's it's needed that you make a professional referral now, uh, what, what's, uh, and how do we identify that is if there are uh, significant periods of time. So generally, there is a time period, you say six months to nine months to a year is a good time for, a, not for a grieving to complete, but definitely see that the graph has, uh, has definitely become better, right? From where it started to where it is, it's a lot more, um, a lot more normalized. But if you see significant emotional sadness responses, even after maybe one year, uh, unable to get back to normal functioning, um, unable to really accept reality and still um, uh, still being in maybe shock, denial, severe depression, then it, it's a point of a specialized intervention is something that's more appropriate because that demands that kind of support and help. So. That's something that that also you know we, we need to understand. Largely, when when we're looking at what is it that that we could do, or you know, in in your capacity, what you could do is the first and foremost thing is to ensure that they have your presence. Okay, um, uh, the, you're just all that you need to do is just be be there to comfort and to encourage and to be with them during that time of loss. Just your presence there. And often, you know, we see that, especially when people are going through intense grief, the, the initial days can be um, the fact that, you know, everyone has gathered probably the initial few days up until the funeral, maybe days later, and then everybody just completely uh, goes back to their own lives. And then, then everything begins to dawn and begins to um, feel extremely um, chaotic and, and heavy. 
right? So we, just being present, just uh, being with them through that grief, uh, sitting with them, listening to them, encouraging those stories uh, helps them to go through that place of grief, okay? It's important that they need your sensitivity. Now, what, what do we mean by this, uh, even as we say this sensitivity, is um, not to suppress, to shut down those feelings. Like I said, you know, that, that's why I took you through some of the myths we follow, that you do not uh, let them feel that what they're feeling is not right, or it is not faith-based, or it's something that they may be uh, disappointing God with, but helping them accept or you accepting the reality that these feelings and emotions are very, very normal, they're normal responses, and listening without judging and pushing them to move to a place of getting better or healing. Just being there to comfort, your role is not to be, not to take away the suffering or take away the pain or make them feel all right. Your role is to grieve alongside with them, comfort those uh, who are being uh, uh, comfort those who are being comforted, right? So grieving alongside with them is the place that we are called to do. So whatever place they are in, um, avoid those statements of be strong, avoid statements of don't cry, um, you know, have faith in God, uh, all of them. But just even if you don't say anything, that's far better than than providing these kind of words okay next is practical assistance so being of practical support during this time of grief because there are multiple number of things that probably need to get done and just being practically there to aid maybe it's uh, organizing meals it's uh, ensuring that um, you know, uh, any kind of uh, legal documents, details, uh, all need to be done. Bank work, um, uh, funeral, uh, funeral arrangements, all of that. All that kind of a practical assistance is what uh, we can offer, and that that uh, you know we could definitely help with. Okay, uh, moving on. What are some of those ways to help? Is yes, visit visit those who are bereaved. Uh, they they need to feel the support and the strength and the concern of others. And that's something that we are called to do. Now, this is just not the role of a counselor, but this definitely is something that we all could do. Again, being careful how we speak and how we react, okay? Um, to be able to just allow them and, and listen, listen well. So, it, you know, I think often when people are talking about... Um, and remember, I spoke about the stages, and maybe while you are talking to someone uh, uh, who's who's bereaved, you will hear this. You know, uh, how could God do this? Or um, you know, I'm so angry with. So there are those emotions that's going to come about. Again, it's very important that we don't negate that, and uh, um, you know, saying that's not how you feel, or how could you say that. It's just to reflect and say, yeah, it is painful. You know, we have many questions right here. Um, it seems hard to understand the reality of all of this. Um, it can be heart wrenching to see that you know you could have done something, but you just didn't know. So any way that you can empathize to walk alongside them is a great way to help them be part of that process of of healing. Okay. The next one is, yes, do not try to explain anything, um, especially the questions that come about. Um, it's important maybe not to explain anything and everything uh, because we don't, we can't, we don't know. And um, uh, all that we can encourage them to do is to maybe speak, is maybe to talk and to, um, and, and often, you know, when they're asking these kind of questions, it's very it's almost like they're talking to themselves, right? And But then they have maybe another person that they're wording out with. So you may also, you needn't feel pressure to answer every question, right? It's just to be alongside with them, empathize. Um, maybe at points of time says, you know, it baffles me as well. I don't know too. I'm, or I'm uh, experiencing the same question myself. And, um, uh, yeah, but I'm just praying that God gives us that comfort to be able to trust him. So anything that helps to work with them 
through what they're going through. So it doesn't mean you need to know the answer. You don't. And maybe you you'll never know the answer. Uh, but to be able to express with them that I hey I am with you. I don't understand this myself. I'm not able to explain this as well. So, but I'm here with you. I know that this is painful, but I want to be here with you. I want to hold your hand with you. Okay. The next is to express support, concern by just being there, a handshake or a hug or a, a you know your physical presence. Um, often, uh, what we've seen is you know uh, we 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 tend to minimize things by saying, I know how you feel, but uh, we don't, we just don't, because the relationship with the one that's who's diseased is so, um, is so unique that we may not really know what exactly or how, wh what exactly uh, uh, it, it is that they're going through, okay? But what we're just doing is to be able to give them a chance to just talk, give them a chance to share, uh, give them a chance to be able to open up. Okay? Uh, again, not rushing them to get better or play down the grief. That's important, again, to give them the time and the space that they need to be able to go through that process of, of grieving. Next is to be patient. Be patient with the with the mourning process. It can be difficult. It can be exhausting, but to be patient and you know just continue the kind of support that is that that is needed for them even as they are going through this this entire experience um, and entire struggle um, of this. <clears throat> okay, um, there are also some some things that um, you know what what we're also called to do is is when we are expressing something it's it's also the words that we use to be more listening to be more loving rather than maybe sometimes using wo uh, words okay because sometimes our words can often be be very very judgmental so to to be careful about that now, when you look at scripture, you will find many scriptures that actually help um, direct us, right, or encourage us to to give comfort, to be able to help people who are in a place of mourning, right, to be able to stand with them, to bear each other's burdens, to comfort with the comfort we have received. All of this is what we are called to do. Never does it say, you know, give them answers to their to their grief it says just comfort bear each other's burdens uh, um, uh you know walk alongside with them there's a time of mourning is to be able to just receive uh, whatever he would like us to receive as well as what he could minister through us so now uh, through all of this it is to uh, it is to just support by your presence by your words by your lack by your non-judgment, through your comfort, through your prayer, through your encouragement, uh, through practical assistance. This, this is this is more than what we are called to do. Okay, all right. Okay, uh, I've been talking for the last one and a half hours, and uh, I'd want to, um, you know, uh, maybe maybe open up the forum to ask if there are questions, any reflections, any thoughts, any. Any kind of comments, anything. I'd like to just open this up right now. <clears throat> Is everybody here in class? There's a silence. Okay. All right. Okay, Jafina. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So any questions or any comments, any thoughts, anything? Yeah. Uh, yeah, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, really helps. Uh, how to be a comfort to a person who is grieving, especially the point of practical assistance that is uh, really good because uh, it's true, like the person who is going through that uh, 
uh, grief may not may have things that needs to be get, to be done but you know they don't have the strength to do it so uh, it's really um, helpful uh, you know to set things in uh, into perspective for them yeah that's that's really helpful even the decision making uh, yeah they may be struggling in those areas at that time because as you said that there are stages that they are going through like maybe denial and um, questioning and all these stages that they're going through so uh, but uh, the they also uh, deep down they know that it has to go on the life life has to move on so mm -hmm. to be there as a you know support in those terms is uh, really helpful uh, i believe yeah that is uh, really good uh, to know that thank you thanks for the yeah that's true thanks for sharing anybody else any other thoughts we have around 10 minutes so we could make use of that for any questions any any testimony any anything at all Okay, it doesn't look like there are any questions. So, uh, what would you like to do? Would you? Um, um, I yeah. just have a question. Yeah, sure, uh, sure, sure. Go ahead. So, in in your um, you know experience, like for a if someone comes for a grief counseling, like how as you said, there's no uh, time. Like there's no set time but uh, usually how long it takes for them to get over or to just accept and move on uh, it should be a long process i believe but uh, like and from your experience i just wanted to yeah. so the so the guidelines like you know there are psychiatric guidelines for a grief process and they say a normal grief process takes six months to nine months, give it three months more, OK? Um, anything beyond that uh, is basically known as pathological grief. Now, even as I'm saying uh, this pathological grief, you're also observing whether through this time if the person is functional or not. So any kind of uh, anything that moves away from the normal into something that's more disorder or disease or deviant from the normal standards away from the normal, one of the first things that you look for is um, uh, whether the person has been uh, has difficulty in areas of function, which means physical functioning, that is yeah, appetite, sleep, um, mm, hygiene. Okay, so these are the three <clears throat> areas that you look at for, for physical function. Second is social function. Are they able to carry on normal social interactions? Or is there withdrawal? Is there avoidance? Um, is there complete um, you know, moving away from every form of social interactions they have? Okay. Uh, uh, also, the kind of responses, uh, maybe certain... Um, uh, certain activities that they have done where they have found help with or they found, um, uh, uh, you know, certain interest activities that they've had, vocational activities, like maybe it's uh, doing some something that they like, or maybe it's cooking, it's painting, it's singing, it's music, it's whatever that they've enjoyed doing. If you find that there's been a withdrawal of it, that becomes a concern. Next is emotional functioning. How uh, how have been their emotional responses? Are they extremely volatile? Mm, is there uh, extreme sadness? Mm -hmm. Is there aggression, uh, uh, anger, uh, uh, all of that? So, so th these are some of the areas of functioning that you would expect to some normalcy. Anything that moves away from normal deviant is when it becomes a concern. All right. So, so, so generally, what? If if it if you find that these categories also are impaired, that's when 
it would move to something that's pathological. Maybe people may grieve beyond a year, uh, but are able to carry on general function, even emotionally, even though they experience these highs and lows. Like I said, there may be more better days than there are bad days. Right. So all of all of this, you, you would you would do like an overall evaluation to understand whether it's moving into this place of pathology or if it is more normal. But generally, someone who is going through six to nine months is what is a general period that you would allow, and especially of how close the person was, what kind of death happened, all of that. Right. So. Generally, you look for six to nine months, give it a um, so, so I think some uh, I, an additional thing that I also want to talk about is coping. And uh, something that uh, you know, uh, and I, and I want to just bring up uh, an example. Um, in my what a 20, 23 years of counseling practice. Um, a couple of years back, there was this lady who came to me. She wasn't a believer. A lady who came to me asking me if I did grief counseling. And I I, did, I said I did. And when she came in here, um, she was actually not looking for grief counseling. She was actually looking for a way to connect with her um, with her diseased husband. And her husband, I think, had passed away almost nine, ten years back, right? So it's been a long period. And she was looking for uh, a supernatural connection. And, and I think uh, I think she got by reference as a Christian counselor, and that's how she came to me. And, uh, you know, so as I moved into the session, almost halfway through is when she said, she said, can you help me connect back to the spirit of my husband? Okay. Um, uh, so then, so then I did. I did share that I do. I wouldn't do that. And, you know, that is, that's not something uh, I do. Um, but I could help her find different coping and find ways of how she could she could feel peace. And um, so, yeah, of course, she didn't. She didn't take the offer at all. Uh, she said, "No, I'm, I'm actually looking at connecting back with the spirit of my husband." Anyway, so this actually shows you how, um, again, I think one of the other ways that you would see is coping. How are people coping with the grief? Mm. Um, now, these, these are different ways of coping. Like I said, one of the most uh, negative or unhealthy ways of coping is substance use or alcohol or, um, uh, you know, uh, or, or these kinds of things, moving into something that is uh, negatively supernatural in order to getting into cults and things like that to reconnect right again all of this are ways of moving away from the reality of the pain so she definitely was one who i would assess as someone who had pathological grief so much so that it was moving into um, something extremely unhealthy and very crippling for her so that's again one more thing that you would examine for to see how coping is taking place. Yeah, I think that's, that's maybe another point that I wanted to bring up. Sure, sure, thank you. That's, uh, that is a very uh, strange uh, case of, I've not heard someone asking mm. like that. Wow. Mm. In fact, there are people, there are uh, spiritists, who actually do that. So when she came to me, she said, I found another person in your area who does it. But because you had a Christian counselor name to it, I thought even you do it. And that's how she came to me first. And then she had actually found someone else uh, who uh, brings back connection with the dead. But that was one of my first and um, a very strange experience too. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good. Okay. Um, if nobody ha else has questions, I think we'll we'll close the class, and because uh, I think many have left as well. So let's just probably close and just we just pray and close. Yes. Okay. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, God, for the hope that we have in you, Lord. The hope, God, that 
through all the pain and the grief we go through and others go through, the hope that all those who believe in you will one day be with you. Lord, will where we will one day see them, Father. That's the hope we have, that our loved ones who've gone ahead of us uh, are people who we will see because of our faith in you. Thank you for this assurance and for the hope that we have. And Lord, even as uh, we meet with many people who may grieve, especially those who do not know you, Father, that uh, you will help us to be your heart. You will help us, Lord, to open their eyes to the truth of salvation. Father, that they will desire, God, to know the truth of what happens after life. Father, even as you've called us, Lord, to minister to those who are hurt and pained and in grief, mighty God, give us wisdom. Lord, since each person, every individual grieves very differently, we need, Lord, the power of the Holy Spirit to minister rightly to them, to minister to them in ways that are customized for their need. And God, you're the only one who can show us that. Empower us to do it, Father. Even though we've read through so many things, heard through many things, Lord, may we not see people like textbooks, God, but may we see them as people who, who are your creation. Father, give us your heart, give us your, your mind, even as we help. Thank you. Uh, equip us, empower us. Thank you again. Be with each one of us, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness over this course. Even as we meet one last week next week, Father, I pray that uh, you will bring all our learning, bring it all together for greater use. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you, everybody. God bless. Uh, please ensure that you finish your assessment. Uh, before the 28th, I will post it by this evening or tomorrow. Kindly do so. God bless and meet you all next week. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.